So this is Port Seton, wonderful jewel of a harbour with working fishing boats where we're going to be spending three days sketching first to find some compositions, looking in all directions where there's so much to work with and also learning to deal with the changing situation, the tide coming in, tide going out, boats arriving and leaving. But I'm going to encourage you to start with some thumbnail sketches. So I've been just doing one or two using a bit of charcoal and chalk and pastel. As I say, looking in different directions, different formats. And on the basis of what you might find from these quick summary impressions will then begin working in oil paint and I'm going to in a moment show you a demonstration of working in a similar way to the Swedish artist Ander Zorn using a limited palette work, working wet in wet with uh, oil paint and alla prima technique which is ideal really for catching these uh, changing fleeting conditions. For our summer school week at Port Seton, we're going to be working under the influence of the Swedish master Anders Zorn. Zorn is best known for his portraits. Uh, he was a contemporary of John Singer Sargent, so working at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, like Sargent, uh, he was um, a virtuoso oil painter who worked with a wet-in-wet -wet technique. He's particularly known as well for um, his use of a limited palette, uh, known as the Zorn palette. Uh, these three colours, titanium white, uh, well in, in our case cadmium red, yellow ochre and ivory black and from these four colors a portrait like the one here of his wife Emma um, has been produced so this working with a limited palette is a terrific thing for oil painters because there is a great harmony to that limited palette and also there's a kind of clarity for the artist you don't get lost uh, working with color um, and it's particularly suited to uh, working with flesh, skin tones, for subjects like portraiture. Now we're going to be working by the sea, outdoors, uh, which Zorn did a lot of himself as well. Here's a nice example, uh, In My Gondola, from 1894, where Zorn's been painting um, in Venice. So for... Um, our outdoor work, we're going to extend our limited palette from those four colours to bring in three more, a couple of blues and a lemon yellow. So with this limited to the four colours, there's a quite a bias towards red uh, and warm colours and the black and white start to look much cooler. The black can even look a bit blue, but not blue enough uh, and eventually not green enough as well for working with some of the colours of the water and um, foliage and so on. So this uh, example of um, the painting from Venice, it's a wonderful example uh, because you can just see, if we look at some of the details from my book, you can see how, as well as working with a limited palette, what Zorn does so fabulously is that he simplifies his subject. 
So when we get very close, we can just see brushwork, we can see paint. And this is, I think, as well as working with the limited colours, this is what's so useful about trying to work under the influence of an artist like Zorn. I'm going to demonstrate now um, a painting working uh, using the approaches that Zorn uh, took. I've got a photograph of Port Seton and I'm going to show you some of the stages by which we can work under his influence. So that's wetting the surface with um, some oil paint so that all the painted marks go on to wet paint and working with a large brush and building up the painting from big areas, gradually working down to smaller details. And because the surface is wet, and we can see this with parts of this painting, in a way the sort of changing light and changing conditions of a subject like Port Seton Harper is perfect for working with oil paint or oil paint is perfect for that subject because the changes in light and the changes in movement in the water is something that can be captured, restated, um, arrived at accidentally using the wet in wet a la prima technique. So the first stage of this process is to cover the entire canvas with I've put on I've mixed a grey from the black, white, and a little bit of the yellow ochre. You can see I'm actually working on old, on an old painting, so uh, that can be quite useful that you can recycle old surfaces. I've put a little bit of spirit into my grey mixture so that it's nice and fluid. And as I've been describing, this is really fundamental to the whole process that everything that goes on to this painting is going to be wet and there will be mixing of uh, wet paint with wet paint. That's been done with a number 12 brush, so I'm going to do quite a lot with a number 12 brush and I'll go down in brush size as the painting develops. And in fact, for the next stage, this is a number six, hog hair again. I've made a brown from the black and cadmium red and yellow ochre. And with that brown, I'm going to start sketching out some of my subject. So here's the photograph that I'm working from. You won't see, see this again, but uh, you'll see it develop as the painting. So then my first stage, having covered the canvas with some grey, is to sketch out some of the main lines, really, of my composition. So when we start at Port Seaton, I will be uh, encouraging you to make some small sketches in charcoal, maybe in charcoal and pastel. It's always good to wander around a new, a new location and have a look at things from different points of view and start to find some possibilities of things that you would like to paint. Uh, and what I'm doing now, which is just sketching out some of the shapes of the boats and the harbour wall and so on, that's the sort of thing you might find through the sketches that you do first and the way in which you, you um, capture that information in a sketch with a, a few lines, maybe some blocks of colour or tone, that's what is worth beginning the painting process with as well. And you'll see that I haven't taken any new paint yet. So as I put in some of this brown, it actually mixes with the gray and that softens it. It even loses its, its uh, darkness, its tone, its tonal quality. 
Um, and that might be something that works to my advantage if I'm after a softer edge, the way in which the light and shade works on the water, for example, is uh, full of these soft transitions. But maybe the edge of a boat, um, a lighter part of the cabin of a boat or a bright colour on a yellow boat's hull is something that I want to be a sharper, cleaner um, quality. So I'll be looking at how to manage that, to manage the mixing of the colour in the painting. But the first thing I'm going to do colour-wise is block in the main areas. So what I see is a harbour wall, some sky and uh, the water, the sea. So I'm going to block them in first, those big shapes, and then work into them with their variations in, in colour and tone. And I've got a new brush that's dropping hairs everywhere. So I'm beginning with the harbour wall and I'm making a mixture with uh, some black, some yellow ochre, a little bit of the cadmium red and a bit of the white. And I've been mixing that with my palette knife because really fundamental to this Zorn style a la prima way of working is that you have a lot of paint. As I've already suggested, when you work wet in wet, the colours you put on are softened and uh, lose their edge, lose their brightness. And so it's important to have stocks of colour that you can return to in order to uh, top up that uh, colour, the brightness, the sharpness and so on. I've been, you might have seen there, uh, I put a drop of medium. So this is uh, in my dipper and it's a mixture of oil and terps. And that, I hope you can see, makes the paint a little bit more fluid. Not runny, but fluid. And that means it's easier to manage, to mix, and to work with uh, the mixing on the surface of the painting. So with that one colour, which is my harbour wall colour, and also something of the reflections, I'm just going to work around my drawing and put in some of the blocks of that colour. Now these boats, as you'll discover or maybe remember, are full of complicated details. They've got masts and they've got buoys and all sorts of things. But we're saving that for now. And you'll have seen um, or heard explanations of artists' approaches to working with colour and light. And there are those who would work from dark to light. Some of us have been looking at Constable. With this approach, um, similar to Zorn's, it's not necessary to work from dark to light. You can actually go in both directions. And what I'm going to be tending to do is block in areas with almost the middle colour and then add dark and add light. So now I need a colour for some of the um, reflections of the sky and the water. There's a, a kind of blue which I'm going to work with next. So with a bit of ultramarine and some titanium white, a bit of the cadmium red. The cadmium red is pretty strong. So I'm always a little bit more cautious with that. That's going to give me the warm, almost purpley blue that I can see. I think the photograph that I'm working with is possibly later in the afternoon um, when there's a lot of colour in the sky. And I'm also going to add some of my brown. You saw me start with the brown, so I'm going to just mix a little bit of that in to calm that down and put a drop of the medium in. So I dipped my palette knife into the dipper and 
uh, mix that through to make that a bit more fluid. So let's try and work with that. So I'm still working with my number 12 brush. And you can see in a way this demonstrates nicely what oil painting brushes are for. You pick up a good quantity of pre-mixed paint on the tip of the brush. So this is a loaded brush and I want to put that on pretty directly, not, not work it too much because the more I work it, the more it mixes. And what's on the end of my brush now is no longer that clean color. It may be there are places where I can still use some of the, the muddied color, but otherwise what I've got to do is wipe that brush, possibly dip it in the spirit if I want to clean it completely, but it's enough just to wipe it on the rag and then I can pick up more paint. And in that way, I can control how much this color firstly mixes with the gray that I'm working into, and secondly, how much it mixes with other wet colors. And for this effect of light uh, on water, where there's a kind of gradual softening of the color as uh, one area meets another, um, oil paint is, is pretty good for that, creating that effect. So I suspect the most common experience for those of you particularly painting outdoors at Port Seaton will be that you haven't mixed enough paint because this wet in wet surface uh, soaks up or not so much soaking up but uh, alters your colour very quickly and that will be to your advantage in some places but every now and then you'll want some clean bright colour and uh, you'll have run out so just expect to mix plenty of paint the next thing I'm going to do is to darken parts of the harbour wall so that I can begin to define these boats a little bit so I'm still working with this um, size 12 brush because that is the best way to simplify. Because I can't do very much detailing because the brush is so big. I have to find the simplest shapes to summarize what is um, in my subject and as I've been explaining every time I do that the paint on the tip of the brush is no longer clean so I've got to decide if there's anywhere and actually with this harbour wall there probably is anywhere that I can use the the muddied paint and one of the features of the harbour wall is a whole set of ladders running down to the boats. And I think actually I might just use up the paint that's left on the brush just to start to indicate them. So as, again, as, as I've been saying, you need to be aware of what's on the tip of your brush and you may use it, but there's no good hoping that it's the right thing. You need to know what it is and use it in the places where it would work. And there's a kind of dark edge to the wall as well. So I've used some not clean paint and there's various things. Well, I know what they are. It's all the old nets and pots. So there's a few things up there that I'm just starting to indicate again, using not clean paint. One more thing maybe to do after I've cleaned my brush with that darker harbour wall colour is to find a few more reflections in the water. The shadows of the harbour wall are also reflected in the water a bit. 
So the big brush simplifies things. And as the artist working with this changing scene, because it will be changing, you know, the tide comes in and goes out. Um, I've got to find ways of simplifying and summarizing that. So next I'm going to mix up some colors for the boats and block in some of the main areas of the boats. So I've switched to um, a number six brush, so it's a bit smaller. Um, the principle really is to try and work with the biggest brush you can get away with. And I want to put on some of the color of the hull of the yellow boat. And actually that, yeah, that sort of goes into shadow a bit. So it's got a, it's got a brighter color at one end. So I'm letting some of this mix at the front. But in a way, everything that I do at this early stage is provisional. It's certainly not, many of these colors aren't the brightest that they're going to be um, I'm going to be able to work back into them and freshen them up particularly in the way that I described you know having enough paint to be able to return to a color and of course um, I should remember that, you know, what's on the brush, if it's been muddied and there may be a situation, there may be somewhere else in the painting where that kind of muddied paint can be used. For example, you know, I'm getting a certain amount of reflection of the colours of the boat. I should have put a bit of muddy yellow in there as well. So why don't I do that now? Um, and I'm holding the brush. I hope you can see I'm not painting with the brush like this. I'm painting with the brush almost parallel to the painting, which makes the business of floating, sitting the paint on the surface a little bit easier. It's less inclined to mix when I do that, and if in this reflection I want the paint to mix a bit more, well maybe I should work it a bit. So there's a difference between the brighter paint on parts of the boat and the softer mixed paint in the reflection. I'm going to do the same thing with the other boat, which has a blue, a blue hull. And as I, I think, reasonably well demonstrated with the harbour wall, I'm starting with a kind of mid-colour, a middle colour, and then I'm going to be, in places, adding a darker and a lighter version. <clears throat> this blue boat has a, a white cabin the windows but at the moment you know my the first stage really is just to get the the larger white shape and it's actually not the color I've mixed probably looks fairly white but it's actually a gray so I'm not using pure white partly because I think that would be too strong I think it would be out of balance with everything and also, as I've already mentioned, in a way, I want to work up to some of the brighter colors and some of the stronger contrasts. So that's some of those shapes coming together. And let's have a little bit of reflection as well. And a lot of that mixing of the reflection is really my original um, 
grey that I covered the canvas with. I'm going to put on a bit of sky. And then I've mixed something for the lighter areas of the water. So in a way it's kind of coming together with what I'm doing in the sky as the light, as I bring out the light in the sky. As I bring out the light in the sky, I've also made something for a lighter colour on the water. And I, I think part of the challenge of particularly painting the water you know, it's a reflection of what's in the sky, so it'll change. And I think one thing that you can try and do as as the day goes on uh, is, is to try and identify two or three colours for the water and probably stick with them because the sky will change. Um, but if you've found... In this case, I've got, well, I've really just got a, a middle colour and a lighter colour. And that works pretty well, even with the grey areas, which are unpainted. Um, <clears throat> the grey unifies the painting, so I can get away with not having to cover everything. So a couple more things now, just sort of thinking about added ways of adding more detail to these boats. Uh, they've got lovely red boys. So I've mixed something for for those red spheres. And I can either, as I've been doing, you know, float this on the surface. It's just got to be really one touch painting. Says he doing two touches. Or if I think things are going to mix too much, and I would like to manage that mixing in a different way. I've stretched a rag over my finger and I'm just going to wipe a point at which I'm planning to paint another red boy. And I know then, because I've sort of prepared the way, there'll be less mixing. So that's something to consider. And then another thing to consider, working with some of these masts and other kind of architecture of the boat. I have pieces of card. This is a bit of mounting card cut, ready for the job of applying paint in a much more, well, I suppose, linear and maybe even more specific way, a way of actually floating some of these finer uh, linear aspects of the the boat structure and imprinting paint on the painting in that way it's nice you get a a more kind of accidental line mark but it's also a way of floating the paint on the surface such that the i suppose the you there's less of a feeling of a a kind of controlled hand at work it's got a more natural quality to it so there's much more I would do to these um, these boats, to the water, but I've just tried to give you a bit of an introduction to the way of getting the painting started on a wet surface, preparing lots of paint. 
using this limited palette and trying to use a big brush to simplify and establish a structure as I have done here and then onto that you can gradually build smaller uh, observations uh, along the way. So just in conclusion, this is the process from sketch, sketchbook to canvas, not a finished canvas. Um, this surface now, a day old, is dry. So apart from one or two thicker bits that might be a little bit tacky, I can apply paint to a dry surface. Uh, the advantage of, one of the advantages of what I've been doing by painting Alla Prima is that there's a great unity and harmony to uh, both the colour and the handling of the paint. I can continue that effect if I want to have a, a slippery, um, smooth surface, if I just oil up the surface, so rub in a little bit of linseed oil, a little bit of medium, and then I can continue working on top of that and allowing the fresh marks, the new marks, to um, blend a little bit with the surface of the, um, the old stage. Or I can um, apply paint in a drier way uh, and have a whole new set of almost dry brush, dry brush marks. Um, and I think with that I'd be particularly looking at uh, adding new texture and adding some more of these details that I talked about, the observations to do with the boats and the smaller marks uh, which can sit on the surface and if I want them to stand out then I'll um, make sure that it's brighter, fresher colour which will sit on top of the dry surface in a more um, uh, exaggerated way. So, look forward to seeing how we all get on.